I know you're going to start. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll introduce Michael Yerman. He's here with SCED. And for those of you who I haven't met yet, I'm Sky Tallman. I'm the new city planner with the city of Trinidad. And we have recently contact, or contracted with uh, South Central Economic Development District and Michael Yerman to do for us a housing incentives program uh, or study. And so what Michael's doing for us is he's working with our community, reaching out to you guys, and he's putting together a menu of options for city council to consider that relate to ways that the city may um, incentivize housing. Uh, so there's a number of different ways that cities do this. Um, we're not necessarily trying to invent, reinvent the wheel here, but we are looking at what our best option would be here, what would be best for Trinidad, and how to cater it to our needs and our situation. Um, how City Council will probably approach this is by picking one or two of the incentives that we'll talk about tonight and really trying to do those well, rather than trying to pick all of these and do a little bit of everything. So that's kind of the, the, the framework within which we're working. Uh, Michael has worked in the housing, in the field of housing and planning in a number of different places around Colorado. He's worked in Salida and Crested Butte and... Um, uh, that's about it. And that's about it. I've worked a long time, but that's... And, and, and now he, he's working with a lot of communities here in Southern Colorado on economic development issues and for us, Housing is one of these key pieces to the puzzle for economic development. So uh, thank you very much for receiving Michael Gehrman, and I'll turn it over to him now. Perfect. So just to touch on uh, and elaborate a little bit more on the agenda for tonight, uh, we're going to go over what we're doing between now and uh, when the housing needs assessment comes, because these two documents are supposed to merge together. And the housing needs assessment is going to really start to tell us what kind of unit types, what demand is out there um, as part of another study that the city is currently conducting. I can tell you from practical experience that housing needs assessment is actually a really important document, especially if you are a builder or a developer in this room and you're going to your construction lender and saying, I want to build 60 units. They're going to say, well, is there the demand there? And the nice thing is the city is going to have a fresh study that's going to show the numbers and the kind of need. And also that study also tells you what the AMIs, what people can afford, where the units need to be and affordability ranges. Um, I'm going to go through what we're actually defining as workforce housing because um, there's, there's all different kinds of terms that are used in the housing industry. There's low income housing, there's attainable housing, there's workforce housing, and then there's free market housing. So we'll talk about that tonight. Uh, we will talk about why we're even considering incentives. Uh, the other one is, uh, is to introduce just a laundry list. Uh, there's about six of the different ones that we have discussed with the council already. Um, and then the last two things that are really important is, okay, we get an incentive program and it's successful. One, how do we protect the affordability? So how do we protect the city's investment in the housing? And then two is who's going to administer it? And, you know, any kind of housing program that gets established and once you start to, to do that, there is an administration piece of that and making sure that the affordability is protected and so forth. And then last will be next steps. The one thing I do want to... To, I'm going to run through some stuff very quickly, and then um, when we get to the incentives, and I apologize that the PowerPoint's not working, I do want to hear feedback on each incentive, so I will kind of at that point start opening it up and taking feedback. We'll also make sure that the people, there's, there's actually seven folks on the uh, go-to meeting to give them the opportunity also to provide feedback. I will say, again, this is, a, this is the beginning of the first steps. I do understand, and if can I just have a quick show of hands? Who are developers and who are builders in the room and who are residents? So we'll start with builders, builder, developers, and residents. Cool. All right. Thank you. Um, for the builders and developers in the room, we all know that March, April, May is kind of prime time. Uh, after the after the snow kind of kind of melts and the, the water tables are still down to get foundations in, so I guess the point of it, bringing that up is our intent is to have this by the end of the January city council to make 
some decision. So I hope to not let this languish. Yes, sir. That's not a problem in this part of the state. Yeah. <coughs> That's nice. I, I can tell you that in a lot of the communities that we service, because we go from Lake all the way out to Baca, that's not the case. And I deal with, in the southeastern plains, I'm dealing with water table issues. You guys don't have water table issues? In some I wish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? I, I got to just share this anecdote. I thought I was, today we were talking uh, about air conditioning units and power usages off the air conditioning units. And I couldn't, I was like, you know, I can't even tell you the last time I spec'd an air conditioner because I've been in Crestview in the last, for the last six years and the last thing you want is air conditioning. Um, so, all right, so why is the city considering this? And so the, I think there's some contributing factors that I think the community is seeing as stress points on the housing. Um, right now, I think we're seeing, and one thing I've heard from, from the interviews, is there's a, uh, the work, the local workforce is having issues with qualifications, uh, and i.e. credit scores to, to potentially qualify for loans. I heard some uh, feedback from some, some of the folks that we did interviews with that, that when they are reviewing potential applicants for rental applications, the credit scores pop up. The same thing when I heard from some developers about qualifying for USDA loans or such. So that actually is on the back end of my presentation about the uh, regional housing authority and how that assists. And I can talk about how that works into all of this because <coughs> the most important thing isn't actually actually building housing, it's actually putting people successfully in housing so that they stay in the housing and that they build equity. And so there's a whole different, you know, there's, there's a brick and mortar piece of all of this, but there's also ensuring that we have the investment in the programs to make sure that people are getting loan uh, consultation and qualifying for programs that actually are really good loan programs that put them in successful positions. Um, there are a bunch of external forces that no one in this room can control that are creating craziness in the housing market. Uh, COVID, as we all know, created a remote work workforce. Trinidad is positioned to be a, as you said, you can pour concrete year round. Um, I can tell you that when I was in Crested Butte in February, I would love to come to Trinidad and not have to take out of snow. So I think there are a lot of people discovering Trinidad and coming here and investing in the community that weren't traditionally here, especially folks from the city um, that are moving down the I-25 corridor. Um, the private industry, uh, I know that the local builders and developers in this room will probably tell me material costs have crushed everything in the last year and a half. Um, I feel you on the lumber, I feel you on the labor costs, uh, and the availability of labor. I thought someone was, were you saying when you, I heard, overheard that you said that you were trying to retire, but <laughs> you can't find any workers? Is that true? Yep. Okay, there you go. Uh, that's, that actually has been a comment that I've actually heard probably now six times from, from different folks that I've talked to in the community. And that's an interesting one. And I'll tell you, every time I go into a different community, there's always one really kind of off the wall, like there's there's a list that everyone's dealing with, and then there's one more that, that each community has that's unique. The labor shortage here is the unique one. Um, I haven't run up against that in other communities. I've, I've heard that the price of labor, like I can choose a 450 square foot job versus trying to build affordable housing, which is 200 square foot. No, I'm gonna choose that, that, that contract every time. There's that, but there's a big difference of not even having the available labor to do even the bigger bigger jobs. So that's an interesting one. I will share this anecdote. I was in the Southeastern Plains. The last thing on earth I was thought was gonna be an issue in Lamar and La Junta, where I'm building 140 units, was land. Finding land to build on, I couldn't find a parcel. I'm still, if anyone knows a, a parcel in La Junta that I can build a house on, please let me know. Uh, and it's always, it's always unique when I walk in and I hear the stories. Uh, the other, the last, the last thing, the last two things is I'm seeing from talking with developers, there's a major gap between affordability price points and what you can actually build right now. And that is again, going back to labor and material costs, and then the supply. I think we have all seen with the supply chain uh, that we have a high demand and a low supply. And if you've taken basic economics, that is a recipe for the way things kind of start to head south uh, with a larger economy. Um, online right now, and there are thumb drives back here with this PowerPoint, so you can take them with you, uh, so you can look at this. There is an AMI chart 
Chaffa, if everyone, does everyone in the room know what AMI is? Does anyone, I can get into AMI. AMI is Area Immediate Income. If you are dealing with government subsidized programs, grants, they always target AMIs. And when you look at Los Animas County, and they do it by county, the issue with the programs that are out there are that we, it's become a housing term that everyone is latched, latched, latched onto. It's called the missing middle. And that's where your typical workforce sits. So there are a whole lot of programs out there, unfortunately, that solve the 80% to 140% AMI. So that's your teachers to your uh, upper management folks. Those, those folks are lacking the ability uh, to be benefited by a subsidized program coming out of most of the, the, the division of housing, the doulas. They have started to turn the corner on that and are increasing their AMIs. They are actually starting to actually get a lot more funding. So I think there's gonna be some change, but up until next year, I don't anticipate there being a magical wand that the Division of Housing is gonna throw out there that is gonna address the 80% to 140% AMIs uh, that, that is really the true workforce housing need. And who, you know, again, when we talk about that, it's, you know, the, the council hasn't set any AMIs to their incentive program, so I want to be crystal clear on that, and that's something that we will, as through this process, start to get to. What's, um, the, what's the AMI for Los Angeles County? The AMI for Los Angeles County for a single person is 51000 Two person is, a two person household is 58000 three is 66, and four is 75. That's, that's your median. But what's interesting is that if you actually, so what we do is for economic <coughs> development, we actually run what is the actual wage. The average wage in town is 40000 So there is a big disconnect, and that disconnect happens because, if, so there's, there's two different things. There's what the folks that are in the workforce that are making, and it's 40000 the AMI includes everybody. So that would, could include somebody in your community that has a really nice pension or retirement fund that's skewing the AMI. And that's another issue that you run into with AMIs and the programs that are out there is they, they define these by these set numbers. And if you make a dollar more, sometimes you don't qualify for that housing program. Or your applicant who is trying to buy a house from you might not qualify. So that's why when we're talking about how to be outside the box and thinking and working with the city, you know, really the answer is in this room right now of how we solve the housing problem. Because we're going to, you know, the, the missing middle, the workforce, isn't going to come out of a state program. I hate to burst everybody's bubble in this room, but that, that, is, that is indeed the case. All right. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is what is actually considered a housing affordable, like what is, what is affordability, not, not if you're low income, high income, or whatever, like what should, what it is defined as. So, like, are you in a successful housing situation? And that is, you're only spending 30% of your income on housing costs monthly. And the issue that is we've seen in the last year and a half is that a lot of houses are becoming cost burden households because those costs also include utilities, right? And so we are seeing an increase in goods and services, groceries, and it's really affecting the workforce the hardest. And so we're starting to see the affordability gap brought in not just because of housing prices, but also because of the growing prices and utilities and everything else that it comes. The other thing that um, is really interesting is that lower income workforce housing, uh, people that are that are in that, that, that 120 or less, they tend to spend 25% of the leftover income they have on commuting. So you have, now you have over 50% of your take home going to your house and your car to get to your job. And so it's how do we how do we create that gap? Um, Unaffordable housing um, it definitely slows uh, growth rate. Um, I'm not going to because you guys can't see this. I'm not going to get into the housing continuum. Um, you can you can look at that, but I do want to talk about um, you know the the other big national things that are out there. The low interest rates in the housing market have also increased buying power. So I think you've seen, we, we have seen a 16% increase in housing prices across Colorado as a whole. That's huge. Uh, and so we want to talk in two years, a jump of 16%. 
I mean, that has gone from, you're basically have gone from a $200,000 house to a $350,000 house. And I think that resonates across the room, right? So those low interest rates, while they're great for buyers right now, they also are driving a hot, hot market. Um, everybody in this room is well aware that the mine is opening. And, and commission, uh, commissioner, or sorry, Councilman Goodwill, Goodwill Health actually said to me, he's like, you've never dealt with a, something like this. And I said it during the first meeting, oh, yes, I have. Yes, I have. And I was wrong. Um, <laughs> Because I actually use so the we have a fancy piece of software that we're even now developers. I plug in what the, what the impact of the quality operational mine is. It is actually a 39% in the county's GDP. That is huge. I have never seen a number pop out of the computer at me like that. I actually once fell off and fell out of my chair. What that represents is $177 million per year in exporting out of this community. What it also means is an additional, beyond the 250 jobs of the mine, it also, it also means an additional um, 150 induced jobs or jobs that service the mine sector. And on, pop, on top of that, that's a $27 million increase in annual wages in this community between the mine and the jobs and the services that provide that. That is huge. I was wrong. <laughs> I mean, I... That's all right. We all are wrong. <laughs> we all are wrong. I look in the mirror every day when I'm... When I wake up and I was I was just like whoa because I, I actually had a I have a factory that's opening up in one of my communities that's 150 jobs and that GDP output which is it's a major manufacturer was 10 percent I was wrong so 39 percent so obviously there are you know, pros and cons that go along with something like that yes. absolutely absolutely um, so I want to go through a list of uh, some some policies that I've seen in other communities. I'm gonna run through this real quick, uh, and then we'll get into incentives. But when you look at the housing continuum, <coughs> right, not one project that anybody is gonna do if you're a developer in this room is going to solve from homelessness to free market home ownership. You actually, when you build your project, there is a target demand that you're trying to hit. And what is important is that when the council's thinking about incentives, they have to look at that housing continuum and figure out where their incentive is going to help and where it's needed most in that housing continuum. So you have basic, you have transitional housing so for folks that are experiencing homelessness all the way out to your $450,000 second homeowner. And if you're a developer, you're, you're building for one of those markets. Um, what's interesting is that we presented the council a list of all different programs that communities have done. And I'm going to share a couple with you that I think are really cool. There's actually a Built for Zero program. Uh, Fremont County is the county in our 13 county district that has engaged in that. And that is a program that is aimed at ending veteran homelessness. Uh, and that's a really cool program. So if, if you take the thumb drive at the very end of this presentation, there's going to be a link of of different links you can go and click on that link and learn more about that program but it's actually it's a it's a national program that communities can engage in uh, and I, I found it really cool because I was actually sitting in a Fremont County Commissioner meeting when they were talking about this program it was in front of my agenda item uh, and it was it was really interesting it's, it's it's a program that is aimed at the veteran population and by extending those services and working with vets you actually then start to incorporate larger portions of those experiencing homelessness. Um, I got some great examples of land banking and land trust. The Shaky County Land Trust um, is, is an example that's on those references. Uh, property maintenance codes. Believe it or not, that is actually the enforcement or working with uh, property maintenance is actually a really powerful tool of actually working on uh, housing in your community, dealing with blight, dealing with vacant properties and having a strategy uh, to go about remediating those properties and getting them back into the housing market is a big piece. Mobile home park rules and replacement. I want to share this one because this one is the, this is to me is like, the, if, if, this, if the Colorado State Legislator was going to solve one problem in the next four years, they should deal with mobile home parks because in Aspen, or in Crestview where I was working, got so much mobile home sales for it. <coughs> Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Half a million. <laughs> Half a million dollars is what a mobile home is selling for in the town of Crested Butte. 
And so it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if you're Crested Butte or Trinidad, in all of those communities, you deal with the same thing when you try to replace a mobile home. And it's, and it's because of the state regulations of taking those out, especially if they were built after 1976, and all the mitigation you have to do, because of all the rules that have come out of the state, it basically has locked people in, especially after, if you have a trailer after 1976, it has made it really difficult. So there are some programs and that Dola is working on on that, um, but I can tell you that, that that one transitions, it doesn't matter if you're Aspen, Colorado, or Lamar. So what, was it the beginning of last year when they passed the Mobile Home Act or Park Act or whatever, now we're paying, I have two mobile home parks, we're paying $18 per space fee into the state. I can't remember the amount of money it's already generated into that program and it's sitting there and they don't know what they're even going to do with it. What they this need, is crazy. What they need to do is create a place for people to take those old trailers yes. and dispose of them. That is, that is to me the, the quintessential thing that's missing. I, I'm dealing with, them. with something newer. Yeah, and, and yeah, and give them the assistance to to loan, but. I can tell you that the hardest thing that I have dealt with in my <coughs> career is trying to figure out where to even take it. And you can't even put it in a look. I mean, some communities have allowed you just to crush it and we stick it in a big burn pit up here on the edge of town. Yeah. <laughs> but if it's after 1976, you know, it's, 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 it's difficult. Right. EPA. So. Is it the materials in the, in the trailer that's tied yeah. to? Yeah. And you can't, once you break them up, they. <coughs> Okay. Can't put them in landfills. You can't yeah. put them in landfills, and, and it, when the regulations have created just a trap for those folks that have them. Oh. And so, to right. to your point, that is that should be a major priority coming out of the state uh, of how to actually spend that money is disposal. Um, well, there, there's some additional legislation that may be coming forth, uh, possibly this next this next year uh, about mobile home parks. And I, I will say this, because I did say the, the, the solution is in this room. When it comes to this one, it's actually, unfortunately, out there at the state level because the regulations have been created by them that have, that have been done. Opportunity zone financing. Has, who's heard of an opportunity <coughs> zone? All right. Opportunity zones are, uh, and I'm actually using this on a project right now. I actually didn't know all that much about it until about <coughs> six months ago. Um, but opportunity zones are, and there are two opportunity zones within the city limits. Uh, so you can go to OEdit, you type in, if you Google OEdit opportunity zone, it's also a link in that, uh, uh, that it's on that list of references. Um, you can actually see if your property fits in an opportunity zone. Right now, with the whole thing going on with capital gains going through Congress right now and the tax legislation, there is, the Opportunity Zone investors have been very aggressive in investments. So I would encourage you that if you look, if you look and you see that you're in Opportunity Zone, let's have a conversation about that because that does allow uh, investment. And it's really for a rental project, um, but they, they basically the way it works is that the capital gain. Uh, investment fund that is set up across the state. There's different opportunity zone investors that have created their funds, and they will actually partner with you uh, on getting those projects up and running. And about half a trillion dollars is in not to mm -hmm. run. And who, where's the funding coming from? It comes from capital gain. So basically, how do I say this politically correct? Because I'm not uh. politically correct. <laughs> uh, it, it is a it is a tax loophole that you can put cap your capital gain um, earnings into, and if it's invested in a property for over 10 years, you don't pay any taxes back on those capital gains. Okay. But there's, basically there's groups that have set up investment funds that collect those capital gains and then reinvest them in your community. So, so there are partnerships in, in okay. Yep. So you don't even have to go out and do it there's actually groups out there that if you have, already a have it in, established in and they're hungry right now because they're looking at the possibility of it okay. going away. Okay. Um, Nonprofit builds, uh, you know, Trinidad State College right now, I've heard about the program going on there. That is an amazing example. Habitat for Humanity, USDA self-help builds. Um, all of those programs I have personally, well, no, not the Trinidad State College, but Habitat for Humanity, 
and um, USDA self-help builds. Those are great programs. Those are ways to empower your local residents to be involved in the community and creating housing. Uh, and then subsidized rental housing. Um, who here has heard of LIHTC? There's a, there's a small group right here. LIHTC is low income housing tax credits. Those are, um, those are subsidized rentals. Art Space is actually a LIHTC project that it was located here in Trinidad. Right. Uh, and they have a targeted AMI. So that is one of those programs that when you look at LIHTC, know what you're getting on when you invest in there if you're a developer because there is an a, there's a very strict AMI cap. However, LIHTC does bring 75% of the capital needed for your project. So it's very lucrative and it's, it's, uh, it's sought after. All right, um, I'm gonna jump over zoning regulations because we don't have a slide projector. All right, so we're gonna get into incentives and strategies, but I wanna talk about one term that I always use when we, when, when we talk about how do, how do we form public and private partnerships. And I had a public works director, it wasn't my term, I had a public works director, that term, this term is, was broccoli cost to me. And it came out of a, um, a trying to build a Nordic Center, new Nordic Center facility uh, in Crested Butte. And he told me when I was fundraising to, you know, in the community to, to create it, he goes, Michael, Michael, Mike, Michael, you need to figure out how we're gonna replace the broccoli for this project first before you start showing beautiful plans of the Nordic Center because we have a $450,000 sewer main that needs to go in, a new water line, and curb and gutter. And no, no, no donor wants to put their <coughs> name on top of a manhole lid. You know, and I was like, huh. He's like, so eat your broccoli, that's what he told me. And so I, I actually started that project by eating my broccoli and figuring out how I was gonna fund the sewer line and the water line. And we actually put that, so we actually took my beautiful site plan and my beautiful Nordic Center and we put it to the side and I wasn't allowed to even show those plans until I figured out how to fund and get the sewer main and the water main in first. And I think that's really important because when you start talking about projects, nothing is gonna kill your housing project faster than your horizontal costs. The stuff under the ground that no one knows about that they can't see and that's actually when you look at the city not the city on the spot but when you look at the city that's what the city controls right the city controls water they control wastewater they control uh, roads and bridges or uh, roads and bridges yeah but um, they don't have any incentives well to... that's what we're going to be talking about today okay. um, but that's but that when you think about partnerships with the city you know and, I, and this comes from my years of local government planning I mean you, you have to remember there are things that the city can be good at, and building houses is not. I actually told one of my town councils one, one year, I said, they asked me why, is, why are my housing units so expensive, and I looked at the council and I said, because I have seven council members telling me how to build a house. <laughs> I'm like, we don't build houses, we, we maintain water systems, we maintain, we maintain wastewater systems, we have a water plant. I'm like, let's, let's work with developers on that, and we actually were successful on that. Um, additional things that really help uh, engineering and architecture fees is 20% of your budget. So if you've ever put a performer together on a, on a building, um, permit fees as well. Um, the again going back to how do we make people successful in housing? Really getting that strong link to the the, the programs like USDA, uh, the first time home buyer, VAs, really allowing your veterans to access home loans, but having that local connection where they can come to somebody and they don't call. A, 1-800 number and get forwarded off to a, 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 an office. Uh, and then the final thing is talking about financial incentives and when we actually talk about that gap funding. Okay, so we are now at the incentive list. And so this is, I'm gonna talk about each one. And the first one we're gonna talk about right now is what I just started on, which is utility and tax fee waivers. And I wanna, the only other thing I really wanna say now before we get I overpromise and underdeliver to everyone in this room is that we have to we have to keep in mind that there is a finite amount of money that the city can actually provide for this. So we are looking at how are any of these incentives going to make the biggest bang for the buck for the city and <coughs> the develop, for the development. How do we create the best partnership? So the first one to discuss is utility and tax waivers. Um, so this would provide a subsidy towards. Uh, paying fees at the time of building permit for water and sewer fees. So that's your tap fee. Um, 
which is about nineteen hundred and twenty two dollars per that's per single family right let's keep that minors multi-family projects so if you have 30 units then it's they're still they're still so i just did a feasibility study on a multi-family unit up there at, at, at city view heights and the city still wanted approximately three thousand dollars for tap fees per unit and there was 22 units my point is accurate so that's sixty six thousand dollars it's a lot of money right. it, yep. it put the project out of the ability well, let's, to let's, happen. that's great that's great feedback let me uh let me just kind of wrap up the spiel and then you can <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> but it's all right. But let's remember that tap fees are essential to the city's right. water and wastewater enterprise funds, right? So when they do, they're technically there is if they're your like your you guys are enterprise funds, right? Yes. So they can't technically waive fees. So they have to take fees from the general fund and put them in the water fund if they give you the sixty-six thousand dollars. It's not a they don't waive a magic wand because their debt service is going to say, um, I noticed that you missed, when they do their audit, you're missing $66,000 from where'd that go? So they, but the nice thing is, so that, that is the con, right? The nice thing though is that from the city standpoint, again, talking about what the city does well, they know when you pull your building permit and they gave you the $66,000 waiver, they know that they're taking the money from the general fund and putting it in the water fund, right? So there is a payment that is going on but at least the city that, you know, again, when we talk about what the city does well, water, wastewater, roads, they are actually paying themselves and making sure their funds are full so that it doesn't get passed on to the end users. Um, there is a, you know, when you talk about the multifamily project, there are ways to, the city can look at their structure, the fee structures, as long as they talk to their debt services. But there's multiple, you know, the, you, if you have a multifamily project, you've dealt with different meters or a single meter, there are, there are different incentives that the city could look at how they structure their fees on a one meter multifamily, which is a rental project, versus a condo project, which would have all of the sun separate meters. So there's other ways that there's other ways to slice it from the city standpoint of how they can restructure the fees. But just, just remember that they they are they at, at the end of the day they are making the water and wastewater fund whole because of the obligation they did when they took on the plant expansion, whatever it was last time you guys did it. So I'm going to stop there on this one, and I would like to hear some feedback on what the development community feels on that. Let's well, let, let, let's go ahead and clarify that you're 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 talking about the utility and tap fees, and that's for utilities that are already there in the street. That's that's not for a yeah. Third, there's no third, main That's not for a third, third, right. thirty lot development where you're gonna you're gonna be bringing everything in. That is on my list, so we'll get there. Yes, and I that that is the broccoli. That's a four hundred thousand dollar piece of broccoli. You're right. Um, any other comments though on this? As far as when, and let's talk about. I want to take. Let me break this up into two pieces. I want to talk about a single family house level and how it could potentially help affordability and how it could help affordability at a multifamily level. So let's start with the single family. So what was it? Nineteen hundred bucks. Uh, I, w I was doing a multifamily up there at, at City View Heights. We did a feasibility study. We had 22 units. Called up the, the, the city of Trinidad and said, look, this is what we're planning on doing. And by the time it was all said and done, it was the, the, the cost of all the fees were more than to build the units themselves. Is pretty much how it, how it weighed out. And what other fees were in there? What's that? But besides water and wastewater, there was, you know, there's water, sewer, power, uh, gas, gas, electric. Yeah. You guys don't control gas. And right? by the by the time it we got, do. yes, we do. You do. So for 22 units, yes. by the time it got said and done, we're looking at four hundred thousand dollars per unit, which is pretty much ridiculous. Nobody's going to. I mean, that's beyond what anyone's going to be able to buy or sell. Or build something for so so and, and then it, w when I asked about about incentives or anything like that there wasn't any there, there it was just this is what the fees are uh, the central meter for multifamily now that make things different because uh, you're talking about two thousand dollars or so uh, you know for say electric 
for for a, a, a five unit building. That's different, but but that wasn't available when when, when I called and, 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 sure. and spoke with. And there's definitely regulations that PUC and everything else that these guys will have to consider when we look at this. Um, let me ask this: Is the tax fee waiver a big enough chunk of change? And asking the group that it takes an unaffordable project to absolutely level. Absolutely, we're dealing at the city water, sewer, oh. gas, and electric, all controlled by the city. So it's not big enough. At 22 units in, in a multifamily, it is big enough. Yeah. It, it creates a, a, a huge vacuum. So for multifamily, it would be single family. I do both. <coughs> I'm, asking, I'm, asking, I'm, asking, I'm asking. So I'm hearing yes for multifamily. So single for family, it's not that big of a deal. Okay. Good feedback. Any other comments from the folks on Zoom? I think Diane's calling. Sure. Let's see if we can. Yep, I can hear you. I can hear you. Who repeats what she says? So you can hear the room. I had a question about the opportunity zone. I know I'm off subject for a bit, but can you tell me who decides where those opportunity zones are located? That was a decision that was made in, uh, was it 2008? So, and it was done through a special commission um, of, this, of the state. And I can tell you that they are not a negotiating board as far as adjusting them. So I, I actually have a situation where I, I can tell you, I've, in my, I, we represent 13 counties. I have, for instance, Lake County, the entire, all of Lake County is an opportunity zone absent the city of, city of Leadville which it should be the complete opposite. <laughs> it, yeah. I just, and, I, and we have gone and asked, I have an, I have an issue with uh, Kiowa County. All six, or all five of the eastern counties from here are all 100% opportunity <coughs> zones, except for Kiowa County was left out. So I don't know how that state commission, I can't speak to it. Um, I'll be honest with you, I was a young whippersnapper when all of that was going on. That makes sense. Sorry, that was not helpful. It makes sense. I, I don't. I don't understand. It is on the north side of town are multiple rentals. That's where quite a few rentals are, and yet we're not in the opportunity zone. I didn't understand that. It's, it's at the block. So the question is like, why is it very fine grained? Where where you might have more need for it. Um, and I think the opportunity zones are defined at the block group level, which are just these larger census defined tracts. tracts. But um, and, so, and so it isn't fine. The, the, process, the process was a, an application, there was an application process at the time. And again, this is, bef this is before my, I don't know, my, I was awakened or whatever, I don't know. Um, whatever you want to call it. The, the, but that group got together. I can tell you, I have tried to, especially for Kyle County, for instance, we have written letters to, to OEdit and asked about amending it, and there's not a lot of flexibility around it, so. Yes, sir. Did you say you were gonna, later on in the presentation, talk about development property? Sorry, the what? The development properties, you're gonna talk about it later on, or do we speak? We have development property. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about you talking about infrastructure? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we're gonna get that. Like that. Yep. Um, okay. The next one on the list is backstop. So any more on the utility fees? This was, this was really great feedback. Um, it really helps to start to understand performance. I understand trying to put those performance together. I've been there, done that, and I can understand on the multifamily. So, it, but what I'm hearing from the from the building community is that at the single family level, the tap fee waiver is just a drop in the bucket. Okay. Well, and it's well, on the multifamily that it really impacts the price of the project. And what's important about the reason I'm asking that question, just so I'm being very transparent, is that the city isn't just going to write you a check with no expectation, right? The idea is that if they do waive tap fees. Do they get a rental agreement in place? Do they get deed restrictions? Well, in it's place? also the main extension portion of, uh, of it too. So, so let's just take City View Heights. 
in order to get that whole thing rolling, we'd have to have an expansion of the sewer, power, water, gas. Okay, so the, the, though that cost right there is, is 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 large, and then you add the tap fees on top of that, it, it becomes uh, a non-doable project. It, 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 it's no longer feasible. And we will get. I should. We can. Well, actually, you know what? For everyone on go to media, I'm going to jump to this one, and then we can go back to these other ones because it makes sense. Um, so let's talk about infrastructure assistance. So. This is a this is a really tough one for for the city. I can tell you, I I had to put in a block and a half of everything: water, gas, sewer, electric, cable. I forgot cable. <laughs> Everyone didn't have internet right. the first day they moved in. They were very upset at me. Then <laughs> um, <laughs> look in the mirror <laughs> every morning. I wake up. I can tell you that it is very expensive. It is really really hard because. What a, the way water and wastewater systems are developed, tap fees go to really the plants and go to the um, and go to maintenance of the lines, right? To existing users. That's how enterprise funds are set up. They are typically there are there are really no and then the other piece of the puzzle is, uh, and I am very cognizant of this. And Mike, you, I'm going to say this on your behalf: is your city staff is as taxed as probably could it ever be. So the idea of your public works crew going out and putting in water and wastewater lines is like not going to ever happen, right? right. So I'm going to say that on behalf of the city because I can understand that because I do not want to get hit by a, a city of Trinidad a public works vehicle tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> like walking across the street because they will do that if I start volunteering them for that. But the reality is that. There are, where this comes into play when we talk about the extension of utilities, normally there's two ways to do it. One is that you actually are extending to publicly owned property, right? So is there, is there property that the city or county even owns that would go past your development that would be a beneficial use? If that's the case, then you can start to look at the grants that are, the city and county are eligible and how to prioritize and plan around those projects. Um, that is really that is really a, an important thing to be thinking about, and that is actually more of a five to ten year planning exercise. So, unfortunately for everyone in this room, it doesn't solve the problem today. Secondarily, there are grants that come around once in a blue moon, and this is once in a blue moon because of COVID and all of the government funding that has come through. The American Rescue Act, DOLA has next year has a has a grant that would pay for up to a million dollars in infrastructure for a project. And so what needs to be happening is the prioritization of projects and looking at the city as a whole of where the properties that could absorb density or hit the city goals could potentially be. And that is a, you know, that is actually something again that the city does well because they have the staff that knows where their utility lines are, knows where their water, water and gas are. And so it's really starting to make sure that the planning documents are in place because when they go, and for, yep. Is that a competitive grant though? Yes. That's the issue right it's, now. It is. And, and to that point, what I was getting in, what I was just about to say is that is where when they look at the grant application, they want to see that the planning has been done to look at the different sites and everything. So that is a proactive thing that the city can be doing. Yep. It does cost time is money for staff, right? So it's prioritizing that, but really starting to map out the different parcels. You guys do have a great GIS system, which is, well. We're working on it. Sky's great. Um, it's just moving. <laughs> he's like, he's like no, starting. Starting. <laughs> I, I will, well, let me put this way, you have one. A lot of the communities I'm working with don't have one. Um, but that, that is a, that is a non, you know, that is not a, major outlay of cash to really start doing that planning. But those are really the two two ways I've ever gotten utilities extended, was by bringing the utilities past a piece of property that, yeah, that benefited the developers, and then also working with, um, working with these special funds when they come available. Um, let's, the, Mike, the I have a quick question. Sure. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, you, you kind of touched on it briefly, but um, I guess when, when, you know, when you hone in on just the grant side of that as a solution, 
and you can even have a return solution um, backing up what you mentioned planning on uh, This is more of a question. Do, do you, does the group collectively feel like the zoning um, really you know, is where it needs to be in terms of projecting out where infrastructure needs to be? So, so that you know, the zoning map overlaid with the infrastructure shortfalls all makes sense and comprehensive from a comprehensive planning perspective. So I'll repeat, so let me repeat that question so for it's a tiny little speaker. So the question was, um, does the current zoning, and, and I know where he's going with this, does the current zoning overlays match where the infrastructure needs are for the community to produce housing? And so that was the question for the group. Great question. Anyone? But it can be changed. Yes, it can be changed. Right. So it can be facilitated. Yep. And one of the one of the big difficulties that always this always occurs in is that again Trinidad. What was the founding year? Eighteen eighty. Eighteen seventy six. Eighteen seventy six. The original plat is your downtown, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where the density was platted. As Trinidad has grown, it has grown in a way that has promoted less density as you go out, right? So it's traditional, the way cities grew for the last 100 years. The issue with that, and when you look at zoning now, is that where the infrastructure's needs are and where the developable property are is out on the fingers, right? Of the town, is that a fair assessment of most, most properties? Yes. So that it becomes that then you're starting to put density on the outskirts of where the services are. And so the question is, is is there a way to look at the zoning map and go through an exercise of looking at densities and where they can be, where they won't have major impacts on lower density areas? And, and, you know, and this, this is addressed in our comprehensive plan, there you go. Uh, but it's not very well addressed through our zoning map. Mm -hmm. So, so like we, we have, we do have some planning documents that do address this. Our comprehensive plan promotes um, infill and Using, taking advantage of existing infrastructure in order to plan for future infrastructure. Um, but, but yeah, it, it's, not, it's not that well. Our, our zoning map is just what you're allowed to do on the land, not really what's easy or feasible to do on the land. One, one, other, one other thing I was going to mention is that uh, this money that may, that may be available, uh, it's a competitive grant. But what kind of weight is placed behind shovel uh, that the project needs to be shovel ready? You have to have the funds for the House Bill of 1271. You have to have the funds spent by June 20, 2024. That means infrastructure in the ground by 2024. So yes, it's, it, it's shovel ready. So the weight that it, it's weighted heavily on that side. Yeah, they, they DOLA, because of Congress, can't have, they will not grant you an extension so if your lines are halfway done in June of 2024, you're not getting any more money to finish your line. Yeah. And speaking of Leadville, I have the issue I have in Leadville because you guys don't have this issue. Is I'm like that's one building season <laughs> before the ground freezes. So we are scrambling to figure out how to put pipes in the ground up there for that that exact grant. But this, again, you guys have have a little bit of flexibility on that. Yeah. It's certainly, certainly a hope that what comes out of here. Uh, is potentially assisting the city in that grant. City has to manage it. So speaking of grants, that is the next one on the list. So grants, uh, matching grant funds. So this is another one where the city actually, this is a good thing for the city, right? This is something the city does well because the city is actually the, 90% of the time is actually the eligible entity to apply for the grant on behalf of the development community. Right, so there is actually a need to have that partnership with the city. And whether it's a letter of support, which is an easy thing for them to do, or it's a cash match, which is definitely a little bit diff difficult, it is a way to leverage funds. And any kind of incentive package, when, if, when the city does put something out, should look at how your application for that incentive is leveraging additional funds, right? Because those funds, especially in the next three years of what's coming out from all of the different acts that have been passed, are going to present opportunities for access to funds, especially around infrastructure. So that, that study and looking at that and looking at the city of how to 
uh, partner on those is a, is a major piece of the puzzle of figuring out uh, how to do that. And again, there's also in-kind match, right? The city can also collateralize their time uh, if they spend time on certain projects. If Again, I'm gonna have to look over my shoulder for the truck coming down the street. <laughs> but if the you know if their if their staff is able to accommodate potentially doing you know some type of curb and gutter work or street extension or something along those lines. Um, <coughs> comments on that? Yes. I think the city's had pretty good foresight. I mean, we've started setting money back for funds just for when matching grants come up and stuff like that. And along with the incentive program taking marijuana revenue and starting funds to address that. So I think we've been pretty proactive in trying to look, get to this point so that we would be prepared. That's great. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I think we, we, we do a document called a comprehensive economic development strategy every five years. I will tell you it's like, if you want to go to sleep at night, just open up page one. It is boring, it is as dry as it gets, but it's the document that makes Los Angeles <coughs> County available for federal funds. When I, when I took the job, the EDA told me they represent 13 states and their annual budget was $120 million. I was like, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that because your grant application is not only the most arduous grant on the planet to apply for, but you also are telling me that the odds of me getting a grant are like once every five years. This, be, I mean, they have, they have had money rain down on the EDA, DOLA, and the redistribution of funds. So, to your point, the city is well positioned, and that's what I think over the next three years we can try to do with this incentive program is really to look at projects where we can leverage funds. So let's talk about how we position the development community best to leverage those funds. All the funds, there's, there's no such thing as free money. So I am a big advocate of, is in your own hands when you're, when you're doing projects, but looking at what's coming out of the feds and out of the state, those will all have different requirements around the housing AMI that's attached to it. The good news from DOLA is that they have raised their AMIs from 60% to 80% for rental and they have raised it from 80% to 140% for home ownership projects, which is a big game changer when you actually start looking at what your returns and your performance are. But on the back end, just, just like probably the city will require, they're going to require some mechanism to retain affordability, right? And so let's jump to that. Now is that, that uh, AMI change, is that temporary or is that permanent? You know, um, the state is getting, and you probably know this, but I, I'm, I'm, I've been kissing the back of my head. The state's DOLA is actually getting a huge influx of funds. And I don't think, is it marijuana funds that are funding the extra $150 million over the next two years? Their budget, has, so just like everyone else, their budget has like quadrupled for what they have. And they have expanded, they have gone from really being just kind of the backstop funding in your last your last ask to actually being a proactive funder, especially at DOH. Yep. When I summer come to council, I'm going to have where that funding is coming from, because I actually just, pres I, I wasn't paying attention to my pre fellow presenter when she was presenting that. <laughs> um, I know what it is, I just can't think of it. But they were funding went from about 20 million to 150 million over the next two years. And so that is going to be a game changer. And so how do, we, how do we position? So I think it also is contingent on the development community to say, hey, I have a project over here that could qualify for that 140, my, my price points for my single family home development of 22 units qualifies under that 140. We need to start to understand the development community and where you are at, when, where your project fits into each of these groups. That will assist the city and accessing the funds and leveraging potential funds as we move forward. So hopefully one of the big outcomes of this whole discussion is really starting to understand where certain projects that have, have the ability to meet workforce housing needs, where your price points could potentially be, and what your threshold of, for lack of a better word, pain is of dealing with playing within those guidelines and under those guardrails. 
Yeah, I uh, question for you on the uh, and, and you're talking about a uh, uh, dollar coming down with these funds. Uh, let, let, let's say you have a pretty much flawless uh, application in for uh, some of this uh, infrastructure funding. What do you, what are you looking at turnaround time from from application to to funding? That is a that is an awesome question, and this is another reason that I'm not in your own your own hands and how you figure it out. It, uh, time is money, right? And it, it does take time. Um, DOLA is typically from application. DOLA is actually probably one of my favorite agencies to take money from because they actually turn around and get it going. The EDA, who we actually who actually signs my paycheck, so I should be careful how I say it. it takes forever. Um, so if you get a federal grant, you're going to be in procurement for a year and a half. DOLA is about a six month period from funding, from grant award to contracting to spending money. Thank you, because some of that other funding that you may have lined up may not be there by the time somebody else says yes. Or the price of wood goes up four times. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, to that point, I think that is why you're seeing the leadership at the city looking at an incentive program, because I think there is a realization that time is money, right? And how do we get our biggest bang for our buck <coughs> by working with the public-private partnership to enable the development community? And if we can, avoid going to door. Um, uh, so, uh, yep. so, so you have all these programs there. Mm -hmm. Just kidding. This, this we're, not a, we're not a thousand home developer down here where we got people on the payroll to figure out what all these programs are like. Myself, I'm an up the river guy. I still have to work every day and run my company. Yep. So who, you know, I've, I've looked at some of these programs and if, if you just don't stay on top of it, it's hard for you to decipher this program, that program, or who is going to be the driving force from the city if a developer comes in and says, okay, you guys, you guys are eligible for this grant or this deal uh, because we don't have paid headhunters out there to do all this research. That is a great question. And <laughs> Sky, and you're looking the same person I am, Sky. <laughs> that, that would probably be me. That would yes. be Sky. well, but but here's the deal. I so I've been in Sky's shoes. I've done his job for going on 15 years, so I know how busy you already are. One thing that has come, the light bulb that has popped out of my head, and this is why we do these meetings, is that actually one of the work products that should come by the end of the year from our organization working with Sky is actually the list of potential development, developments that are significant to the community. So unfortunately, I, what I mean when I say significant, I do mean that if you own one lot, that you want to build one house, probably doesn't make it on the list, but if you're building 10 units, let's let's start to figure out, let's start identifying parcels. Again, we do have GIS on our side, so we can actually create and map where those differences are. And then when we actually talk about infrastructure, you know, when you have clusters that can produce bigger workforce housing, maybe that's the House Bill 1271 water, wastewater, electric line extension that benefits multiple developers. Uh, one more thing. Uh, sure. We do have the property. We just we have 38 acres in the city limits, and we have 60 acres just outside the limits. One of the problems that I had, and it's a great thing for the city, but they took the best people out of the private sector out here and put them in their building, which is great for the city. You got Bob Juss, you got Nate and everybody over there. Fantastic, the 18, they have the 18 working for them. But us out here in the private sector, now I talk to engineers and stuff to want to come down here. It's like, psh, you know, we're swamped up here. We're not. We're not interested in coming to Trinidad. So, and that, before you start there, yeah. I'm going to put this in some city council's minds. So I've already put this in the city manager's <laughs> mind the other day. But you have all the equipment and everything in there, and some of these businesses or these developers over here, it's like. Help us get these streets developed and engineered. If not, you're not going to get it done. I'm six months out if I call today to 
try to get somebody down here to help. I'm six months out just to come down and do a preliminary plat. I'm 65 years old. I don't have enough years of my life to sit around to see when it'll come to fruitation. I, I understand 100% what you're saying. And that, so to digress real quick, I'm doing a project across 10 municipalities, across six counties in the southeastern plains. John back there in the corner who works with me, tomorrow or on Monday we have a survey crew coming for one week and they gotta do 10 different, 10 different cities in one week. And then they told him, what did they tell you today? They're not coming back for another five weeks. They're five weeks out. They're, they're five weeks out. And they were probably one of the bigger, they were, the, they were the only surveying firm that I could find that would even take the job, and it was a huge contract. To your point, the way those, all those little towns are gonna get this housing project done is they combine forces and they ate the broccoli, which is the design and engineering <coughs> cost, because if they would have passed it on to the development community, it would never have happened. You know, there's so, one other aspect to all these grants. I mean, you can go ahead and apply for the grants, you can get the money, but there's also the red tape on the back end, yep. the, re the reporting. And that's one of the issues that I think that a lot of people don't quite understand that the, the reporting is necessary to complete the project at the end. So there's two great ideas that came out of here that we should put on the board. One is technical assistance, right? And to that, I would say, if you've got a project that may be shovel ready soon, you should let us know at the city, because when we're looking at grants and we're looking for what we should apply for, if we don't know that there's a potential project out there, we might we might just keep looking. We might not think of that as a as a real opportunity for us. So And then uh, this and then this What am I writing down? Again? So this is a whole other number. Don't we make this five. I think this is this was this is the last slide on my presentation is other ideas. So I think two really great ideas came out. One is technical assistance and actually an incentive program that would actually help with a stipend to to help with engineering and uh, surveying costs. Again, so that that could be a really great incentive that could potentially um, do that. And then the last, so or even feasibility. That's well. That's a different. That's a different animal. But we. I'll talk about that here in just a second. And then the other piece of the puzzle is um, with technical assistance is grant writing and grant administration. Those are two okay. great. Those are two great ideas. And again, I love those ideas because those are actually again, we're talking about things that the city can help that they that they do well. One, well, I'll just tell you. I, like I said, I got 101 units built, and I didn't swing a single hammer. The way I got them built was helping the local contractor do what they did best, which was build houses. And eliminating that. You had a cut? Yeah. Is the housing situation that you've done, is that a cut and paste for Trinidad, or do we have to? The, the cut and paste part of that is the economy of scale aspect, right? Anyone in here who has done a pro forma understands economies of scale. Uh, it's easier to build, it's going to be a lot cheaper to build 30 units or 40 units right. than it is to build two. What you guys are discussing, and with these two, these two last ideas, those are economy of scales ideas, right? How do we work with an incentive program that says we have two or three properties that are ready to go into planning, and how do we move them through a process to get them through entitlement? That that's what's right. about in that process. Okay. Yeah, I am I am the planner for ten communities. So you, right now. you can kind of eyeball it by square footage. Pretty much, if you if we come up with the data, I, I I mean it comes down what it comes down to is really looking at where is the incentive most advantageous to create the economies of scale for the city, right? So the reality is if there's a property that's way out here that the infrastructure line is only going to benefit that property, it's probably not, not the most advantageous incentive for that property. But if you have a, a group of properties for development, the development community controls that are close, especially when we're talking about potential grants coming down the pipe, that is where the city should be focusing its efforts because you do need to be shovel ready by next November. So the broccoli would dictate that? Well, it would be the cluster right. that, that dictates that. Okay. But yes. Okay. And, then, and that's where you start eating your broccoli. Right, right, right. <laughs> I eat the broccoli. So, uh, Michael, Gary, and Zoom, one other thing that we might consider in those broccoli costs 
is the uh, right now we're using brownfield grants for the phase one, phase twos, um, but the mitigation costs and there's a lot of areas you know that have been mined and so on, or uh, if, in our case, you know, trying to repurpose buildings. So you know, any assistance that we can put on there is another um, assist from the city is grants for mitigation of hazardous materials. So Gary, thanks for that one because it was on my slides. I skipped over because I got, I got going in the wrong direction. Abatement assistance. So let's talk about abatement assistance. Um, obviously, Trinidad has a lot of old housing stock. There's a lot of asbestos. There's lead paint. Um, one of the really hard things um, beyond what Gary, what you just said, talked about, is actually where you dispose of it, right? And working with the city on how <coughs> to potentially take that material. Um, there is some CDPHE permitting. Again, I'm now going to get run over by a city <laughs> dump truck. <laughs> but, I mean, so there is a lot that goes into taking those hazardous materials. Um, but obviously, when again, going back to the mobile home example, when you only have one or two landfills across the entire state that take that, so the question becomes then, is there, are, there, are there incentives that the city could help with with transportation of materials? I mean, there's one thing to completely finally dispose of it. There's another thing to say, hey, maybe we create a holding area for that and we take it all at once. You know, so the, are there ways to think gotcha, about? Gotcha. Are there ways to think yes. about it differently outside the box? Thinking, I, sorry, Mike. I know you're like, you're like, you're like <laughs> our, our our landfill is grandfathered yeah. in. We don't have a liner. We're allowed Ooh. to take non-friable asbestos. Yep. We cannot cannot take friable asbestos. So um, it would, and we can't hold it there either. No, you wouldn't hold so, it there. You're right. Um, <laughs> no, I understand. So but but I. I like where you're going. Where you know, grants. We we just got one for the Fox Theater. Although they're they are funding yeah. through the APA and through um, Department of Public Health, but I believe the city has to partner with the developer to apply. Yeah. So I think this is something we should put on the radar. If, if you know if it's whether it's um, coming through the oil and gas funds and we're dealing with dirt, you know, or if we're dealing with more of the horizontal problems. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, I want to make sure I didn't miss any, um, we didn't, we didn't actually talk about gap funding, let's put that on there. So the gap funding is, this is the, the one that's going to make the elected in the room cringe, so I'm sorry to bring it up, and it's going to make Mike cringe, it's going to make me cringe, it makes guys cringe. But this is, gap funding is that, that true direct subsidy when you talk about affordability. It can come in different forms, but it is really talking about you as a builder, the best you can do because of your infrastructure costs, uh, your tap fees, et cetera, et cetera. The best thing you could, you, with you still making a buck, is 320. But that's not affordable, right? Now I'm using this as a hypothetical, so please remember that. What a direct subsidy or the gap funding is really saying, what does it actually take to get that 320 unit to 220, right? And that's the direct gap funding. And it comes in different forms. Fee waivers is a way to provide gap funding assistance. Land donations. So can you use, polit or, um, can you use publicly owned parcels to help buy down costs and create housing. Uh, that works really well with a for sale model. Um, and then there are direct payments to buy downs on projects. What I will say on that, on the city's behalf, is that is a really tough pill to swallow because that it, it's, it's hard to fund. I will tell you that the only way that I have ever done it in my career is that we had a dedicated funding source. And so if you were to create a dedicated funding source to go into housing, that is where you can actually start putting money into gap funding. So well, I just moved up here from Santa Fe, and how they do that there is um, when you do a, a larger development, you either build affordable units or you pay a fee in lieu. And that fee in lieu goes to a housing trust, and then that housing trust can then pay into things like this. So that other people who are doing affordable developments can access some of that capital, but it's 
It's just where it's where developers who aren't doing it, they're kind of doing it by not doing it. I owe everybody pays. I, yeah. Everybody pays. <laughs> yeah. But I will also tell you that the newest <coughs> trend in the housing industry is short-term rental regulations and taxing short-term rentals. I will tell you it was a game changer for the town of Crescent View when they placed a, a short-term rental tax on uh, the ballot. It passed 89% in that community. Uh, and it generated at first about 325,000 a year. And I was actually able to go from building six to eight units a year to 25 units a year, just with that, because I was able to leverage that money through grants and through other things. Yeah, I like that. Secondarily, it, the reason it passed 89% was that the folks that were paying it are, are, the, are the visitors that are actually putting the biggest demand on your community services. Mm -hmm. And so and it's, and it's the putting the biggest demand on your service industry. Um, and again, I'm not here to, to push tax initiatives, so, um, but I'm just, just putting it out there. But that We're is- We're gonna lay it on you when we put this forward. <laughs> yeah. I'm you said it. It. He said it. He <laughs> said it. I said it. I said it. I said it. I just put that on my grave, right? Um, how, many, how many short term rentals were there in that town? 212. Just not hard to come up with that dollar amount that you talked about. Correct. Here in Trinidad right now, I think we have like 65 or 75 short term. That's that you know about. Yeah, you'll be amazed. Yeah. Oh yeah, that, yeah. that's yeah. correct. We have that's 212 big. easily. <laughs> uh, I would imagine, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. and that, that is something that, that I will provide. There's, and there's, so real quick, I'll give a quick spiel on, there's two reasons to regulate, there's two paths of regulating, and they're completely different ordinances of why you regulate short term rentals. One is because of your lodging. Even if you don't have a separate tax, you have a lodging tax. Yep. They are subject to the lodging tax. Your lodging, the reason actually in Crested Butte that it passed so overwhelmingly is actually the lodging community woke up and realized that they pay commercial property tax, short-term rentals pay residential tax. So they're already getting a major discount every every year on the yep. property tax. Because if you, if you anyone, who has commercial real estate in the room, you, they, yep, Gallagher Amendment, you pay three times as much, right? So there is definitely a disconnect, and also they built under the IBC. Your single-family house that got turned into a VRBO is now under the IRC. The second, so that that tax collection and raising funds for the community on the services that are being demanded from the short-term rental is one reason, and that's one path and one ordinance. The second is the nuisance piece, and I will tell you that if you do start regulating short-term rentals, you will have to take on. The regulation of the nuisance as well and if you are just starting to see short-term rentals it's actually probably a little bit easier than what I was inheriting which was a 25% of our community with short-term rentals and having to go door-to-door -door and changing out light fixtures because and, and I'll tell you the, the funniest story about the whole short-term rental thing was the best outcome was I had probably 10 or 12 people come up to me and say thank you for telling Getting that floodlight out of my bedroom window because they had a you know they had a downcast. But the, every time the runners came home, they flip on you know they come home from the bar, they flip on the back light in their yard and would shine all night long. And you know just by making them change out the light fixture in the backyard, the neighbors could sleep at night. Barrier proof trash cans in Crested Butte was a big deal because so many people didn't have trash cans for vacation rentals. They leave trash days until Thursday. The bears, the bears come in on Monday, and the neighbors, clean, neighbors out there cleaning up all the trash out of the yard. Um, the other thing is parking, you know, and looking at you know the parking as a nuisance. When people come, they when they come here, they bring their mountain bikes, they bring their boats, they come, they they all, you know, their families come from all over, and it's a great experience. You want them to experience your community, but you have to deal with the neighborhood impacts when you when you when you start talking about this. The other problem that could possibly exist, and we've had this discussion with our attorney already, is that when you start to regulate or over-regulate, then you get into ADA issues and all this other stuff, and who's going to go and on a yearly basis or a six month basis to All right, let's talk about that. See. Yep, so we dealt with that too. So you actually wind up with a, you wind up with an additional building department inspector is what it winds up happening. It's, a, it's half of their time is now going to be short-term rental, and half the time is not. The things you, I don't know about the ADA compliance issue. We didn't have that issue. 
um, because it hasn't come up because it, the occupancy technically doesn't trigger ADA. Right. But what does, what you do become once you start licensing them, if you go into a licensing regime, you do check for life safety. And I will tell you that if you go and you and you read about the really bad instances where a community gets a really black eye, it's the carbon monoxide detector ran out of batteries and wasn't there, or there was no fire extinguisher, or there was no rail on a second story deck, you know, that some kid ran off. And those are the things that if you're going to operate operate that business, it's actually at the end of the day, I can tell you that I, there was so many property managers in Crested Butte that also came up to us and said, thank you so much. I've been telling this guy for two and a half years that he needed to replace the deck rail because he didn't have one. And he said, no, I'm not going to do it. The city came in, and big bad city, made him put up a deck rail, and the property manager was so it's like, thank God. We've been asking and asking. Yeah. But there is, but what happens, so there's a difference though. The tax doesn't fund the employee. The fee for the license will fund the employee. And that fee is based on the number of units and what it costs the city to hire to do the service. The fee does not go into affordable housing. It, you can only charge, and I'm sure you know this as elected, but the folks in the room, you can't charge a fee as a tax, right? So you can't put a $1,000 fee on a short-term rental and say, we're gonna generate $200,000 a year in fees, and that's gonna pay for affordable housing. It actually only pays for the fee that the service does. You'd actually have to have a tax to actually fund a board of So and it has to be just an absolutely justifiable that fee that it's not too exorbitant on either. That's the other issue behind that. Yeah. We dealt with that with the marijuana when it come in on gross, putting a twenty five dollar per pound fee that goes into our utilities to help you know, the um, utilities for growth or whatever. So um, so let's talk about the last piece of the puzzle then, um, or two less real. We're at 6.30, everyone good for going another 10 minutes and then I'll, sh then I'll shut up and then you guys can all go home. <laughs> all right, uh, two last things I do wanna talk about uh, with the group are expectations for incentives, which is how does the city protect affordability and then who administers them because again, this guy's already gotten about six years worth of work out of this meeting for me. So he, he, he's not gonna be your new restriction manager uh, if, if you guys go down there. So first and foremost, let's talk about what the expectation is on an incentive. So this isn't a handout. You don't expect it to be a handout. It can't be a handout because if it's a handout, then it's just going into your pockets that is respect and you're making profits on a handout. Well, what the city needs in back is, is workforce and housing, right? And so how do they get that assurance from the development community? There's several different ways. You can put a use covenant on a property. A use covenant is a little bit less than a deed restriction, but what a use covenant basically says is that the property has to be used for a long-term residence. Then you can go into the next layer of the onion, which is a full-blown deed restriction. And when you start talking about deed restrictions, that actually starts talking about who lives in the unit, right? So that is, what is your AMI? How much can you make? And then the next layer of the onion on deed restrictions is, is there a price cap of depreciation? Depending on the subsidy and the way I've done it through the years, is if it's a huge subsidy, like in, like in Crestview, I was actually doing a $80,000 per door subsidy that folks were getting, those were, those were full blown deed restrictions. Cap appreciations, 3% a year max on what you pay for it. You had to have full-time employment in Gunnison County. Um, you know, you had to verify your income, and there was capital improvements that were limited on the property to protect affordability. Then I had the second layer, which was, uh, for instance, ADUs that we allowed. ADUs were just given a permit fee waiver. But they only had to make sure that the applicant, or the, the person occupying it was a full-time resident. So there's different ways to structure it based on the subsidy. Um, and you can create deed restrictions to kind of encompass that. The final one is um, the other, other tool as it relates to rental is rental agreements. So rent control in the state of Colorado is illegal. The city cannot impose rent control. However, 
the developer and the city can come together and sign a contract, a rental agreement, where they, where you as a developer agree to rent at certain levels, right? And that's where the city gets the benefit of, okay, we're gonna have rentals that are priced between 80% AMI and 100% AMI, so maybe in a 30 unit complex, they give you a subsidy for 66,000. They get 10% of those units are gonna be priced between 80 and 100% AMI, right? So, and that is in the agreement, there's a, normally there's a time period that is agreed upon, uh, project affordability, the typical time period is 30 years. Because uh, that's the life of the, of the property. Um, and the only other thing I'll start to get into is that, so this gets into the, to who, who A, monitors the jurisdiction and then who, who gets the housing. Right, so now all of a sudden the city has created an incentive for, for especially for sale units, right? <coughs> How do you determine who gets to go into your housing that you priced at 220 that is 120% AMI? So where, where that comes into is actually the need for having a regional housing authority. I'm encouraged that the city council is going to be meeting with the county commissioners because I'll tell you that it is going to be best done at a regional level um, and working with the county. Uh, the regional uh, housing authority, there's a couple of key tasks that they, are, that they would do. One is qualifying applicants for, for lotteries, right? So if you actually get into a, get into a, a place where, the, where a developer is offering 10 affordable housing units, you can actually create lottery procedures. There's fair housing law that has to be followed. You need a housing professional to, to actually administer that. And as a developer, there's nothing better for you than to actually say, you get a check at the end of the day at CO, right? Because you know they're paying 220. You get made whole at the end, and you actually don't have to take the buyer through the process. It's actually it's actually a really good deal. And I'll tell you the other really funny thing is that <coughs> the developer, as I've had developers go through affordable housing builds, they love it because the <coughs> affordable units don't they're not spec homes. They know who their buyer is the day they break ground. And so the bank actually loves it too because they're getting made whole right on the back. It's the four hundred and fifty thousand dollar house that sits out there for six months that makes you cringe when you're paying paying financing on that, right? The other big one is um, loan consulting. I can tell you it is the most nerve wracking. I did it myself. I went out and tried to buy a home. I went to the bank, sat down, twenty twenty four year old me sitting in front of the bank with my, my little down payment, and they told me, oh yeah, you're great, you're good. And then I started looking at the amortization of my loan and how much I was gonna pay in interest, and I, the fact that I, I wasn't gonna even pay capital until 20, 2017 or whatever it was, I was just like, whoa! And, and I, got, I got taken advantage of. It was a predatory loan <laughs> that someone told me. I backed out of that. And I actually went to a first time home buyer class that, the next month, sat there and I learned all about loans and everything and I realized I was like, I'm not gonna do a 0% down loan. So I saved my money and then put 20% down and, and did it. But if you don't have somebody that's there in the community that isn't interested in the loan product they're trying to sell you, they're more interested in you as a human going into the housing, that is what a regional housing authority provides. They, you know, the other thing is the South Central Council of Governments, I don't know if they still do that, but I was on a uh, uh, a board that in the early 2000s that they had uh, rental assistance and they had also they guide people who wanted to buy a home and they'd sit you down and just go through the entire process. I'm not sure if they still do that, but I, I think it still might be available. And what we did with our Gunnison Valley Regional Housing Authority is we worked with the COG to offer the class every quarter. Right. And so we would, we would do the advertising and they would actually run the class. Because your one your one employee that we're imagining is going to do all this is they're going to they're going to they're going to put the sodas out like I did tonight is what they're going to do. Um, they you can also under the other big thing is that a regional housing authority does have then has access to energy assistance and rehabilitation services. So they are a go out and get grant funding, um, and because of their status as a quasi governmental agency. They then also are another agency bringing in grant funds in the community. They can administer lotteries. I can tell you a lottery story, but you guys don't want to hear it. It's late. Um, they are the they are the they are the hammer though. They are the hammer on deed restrictions. So, if you are well, the developer, you guys have disposed of the property. If you're an owner that tries to sneak 
short-term rental into your, you know, every three months you leave and you go down to Arizona and this is, this is just your second home that you got us to. They are the, they're the, they're the unfortunate bearer of bad news that says you don't want to qualify to be in this house and you have to sell it. I've only had to do that four times in my career over six years of doing this. It's a very uncomfortable conversation. But they have to be the ones to do that. Um, and it's the right thing to do. And then the last thing is that when you talk about some potentially the partnerships with rental projects, when you talk about LIHTC, they actually can also be a property management um, agency. I think the current one that exists today is managing a property today. Is that correct, Mike? Um, uh, art space. Is it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that being managed through the city or? or no, no, that's through the art space. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, but there are there. That is a funding mechanism for that. But to really have a functional housing authority, it does it does require an outlay of cash every year in the yearly budget between the city and county. So how do you fund that? And obviously you don't have funds right now targeted for that. So, but that is an outcome. If, and that is a good, this is a good outcome because that means we have a successful housing program going forward right now. So, sorry about that. Um, so that is really the final thing. Um, again, there's thumb drives in the back that have the presentation on here. There is a list of references. Um, if we don't have enough thumb drives, I think I actually have a couple more in my briefcase. That we can actually, I, I, I can email it. Yeah, we can also we can also email it. Um, but you're welcome to take a thumb drive. Um, that one actually has it on there. Um, uh, that has it, and then at the bottom, at the end of the presentation, is a bunch of links um, that you can click on that'll allow you to go and check out all these resources we talked about. So thank you. Any awesome. comments? Yeah. Awesome job. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. And, and I'll, I'll just close with one comment. Uh, Michael mentioned two prongs of our three-pronged approach right now. So we're doing uh, our housing incentive study with Michael. We're also working with another consultant to do our housing needs assessment, which is going to give developers and uh, council and everybody in the community a good sense of what we need and what the pressures are in the housing market. And the other thing is the city you know, my initiative is to look at how we can ease barriers to housing in the zoning code. So many of you have probably already seen the survey that's out there, but over the next three nights, or the next three days, um, there's going to be three more public meetings. It's the same meeting, just three different times and places, um, uh, looking at how we can reform the zoning code to reduce some barriers to housing. So if you aren't already aware of those, I have a flyer here I can give to you. Um, if you are, I may be seeing you again in the next few days. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Okay.